Hello, everyone. Welcome to Computer Science E7. This is Lecture 9, Digital Cameras. So starting today, we've been doing a lot of leading up to this point, but starting today, we're really going to start getting into the nitty gritty of digital cameras specifically. So whereas a lot of the, the uh, techniques and topics that we talked about up until this point could really be applied to both film photography and digital photography, today we start breaking it down and, and having a, a an enjoyable time with, uh, with the digital aspect of digital photography. But of course, I'd really love to tease you guys, and so I'm going to tease you one more time. And before we get into that stuff, talk about assignment four, raw material that has just passed out to you uh, just now. So in addition to the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in addition to the usual parts where you have a problem set style part, a, uh, a collection of photos, and a, and a part where you are discussing your photos online with, uh, with, your, uh, with your fellow students. There is also a fourth part in this one where you're going to be designing a website theme for the course website. And so there's multiple components to this, as you might have noticed um, in your perusal of the website up until this point. First and most obviously is the photo at the top, the banner photo that exists at the very top of the page. And there's a very specific size um, and, and uh, not only size, but color requirements that uh, we give to you for, uh, for processing this image and, uh, and submitting it. And so you'll notice that uh, if you actually take a look through the, uh, the problem set that there's um, the size is set pretty rigidly at 898 pixels by 250 pixels rather than a very nice and cozy 900 pixels by 250. And that ended up actually being um, because of a long-standing website bug where it basically takes off two pixels from, uh, from the sides of the image. And those of you that are familiar with um, coding websites and CSS in particular might know the sort of hassle that I'm talking about. So that's why that uh, particular requ requirement is sort of strange. Now, in addition to this photo, which by the way, I certainly recommend uh, you take this photo in RAW and then you process the photo so that you are able to squeeze as much uh, quality out of this photograph that you possibly can. Um, undoubtedly, this will want, you want this photo to be sort of your best image that you have so far, your most representative image of, of your style um, of, or of your skills even. And so just because keep in mind that whereas in the, uh, in the Flickr user or in the Flickr E7 group, where we share all these photos with each other, we don't really share these photos with the outside world. And we do actually have people from all over the world coming to visit this, this page. So you really, this is much more of a public way of, of showing your photos um, to the world. Now, in addition to that, the photos also come with a color theme. And you'll notice that every um, theme that is on E7 has a different color theme. And so, oh, I should have loaded this beforehand. Um, now, in this theme, for example, all of, or all, and rather in all of the themes, what they try to accomplish is to get the overall color theme from, the, from that particular photo and replicate it in the website itself so that um, when you visit the site, then, oh, it's the same photo, so that it, ha it has a sort of contiguous feel. So you might have, if you have very primarily green photo, for example, you might have a theme that includes a lot of green. Now, specifically, there are four colors that are involved with this particular theme. Um, there's a background color where for the, uh, the background of the page as a whole, a content background color, then a text color, which in most of these themes is black. So usually the content color will be a light color, like a, a, a cream or a very near white or a very light green, as in this case. And then finally, a highlight color, which is used for the link text and also the lines that are drawn around the content type or around the, the content of the page itself. Now, um, in each of these, uh, so you'll, you'll, what you'll do is you will select a color theme for these four colors, the page color, the content color, the highlight color, and the text color. You will format the color in a particular way in this format called hexadecimal. So those of you that are familiar with web programming might already be familiar with this, but if you're not, don't worry too much. Um, this, we've, we've already dealt with this sort of thing in a, in a different way. So if you remember from a few lectures back um, when we talked about 24-bit uh, color, or specifically JPEG file format, we said that we had eight 
bits of color information for each of the primary colors in terms of computers. So red, green, and blue. And each one had eight different bits of information. And that sort of thing is replicated here. We have, you see, we have six total digits. So that means that we have three pairs of, of information. And that is exactly what this is. So the first two represent red, the next two represent green, and the final two represent blue. Now what makes it hexadecimal versus normal decimal, a normal number that you and I would be able to understand, is that it goes not only from 0 through 9, as we know, but it also includes A, B, C, D, E, and F. So which means that rather than each digit having a total of 10 numbers possible, each digit has 16 numbers possible. So that means that if we have two digits at 16, that each of these pairs can represent 256 distinct colors. So basically we're cramming all of this 24-bit information into a very shortened, uh, into a very shortened um, representation of one particular color. Now I did go over that pretty quickly, and don't worry about it, there's a lot of, uh, of there's a link uh, on, the, uh, on the problem set itself, and also a lot of information online about hexadecimal colors if you're confused uh, or if you have any questions. And of course, you certainly can feel free um, to uh, send an email to us and we'll be able to help you out with that. In addition to all of this, um, you might be wondering how you can actually pick a color uh, or a theme of colors that would actually work for you. And so we do actually include a number of websites as well that I'll just show uh, a couple here where you can generally um, oops okay what's well, its colors I know that I know that this worked because I tried them all before I had these uh, these printed and what you generally can do with these is you upload an image or you or you send this these websites to a you are a location of an image and it helps you out it shows you some of the major colors that are associated with that image and then your job is to try to figure out which ones you like best and which ones are going to look the best with your photo and be legible and uh, be, be uh, well represented on the website. And in fact, we do provide one neat little tool where you can enter in the four hexadecimal numbers and click a button that says try this theme and then it will show you how that theme looks on the website. And there is something very important to note and that is that the, the top um, the top image won't actually change. So what you might have to do is after you try the theme, you might, um, you might bring up your photo in Photoshop, for example, and just hover the window over the, the website so you can try to get a feel of how it looks. But just to give you, give you an idea, I can try to enter in a theme right now and just show you what this might look like. So a page background, I might use um, all Fs, for example, which will represent the color white. Uh, content, maybe I'll do something a little bit less than white like a sort of gray highlights well let's do something uh, sort of crazy and do all red and text we'll just do a very simple black now when i click try this theme you'll see that it changes the colors to represent what your theme might look like and in this case uh, this is a reasonable theme because everything is legible it's not really contrasting it's not really uh, harsh on the eyes or anything like that and that is what's one of the most important things about this theme is 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 that not only do you submit a very good uh, photo that is, that is pleasing to the eye, but also you're able to um, use the representative colors from that photo to make uh, an aesthetically pleasing and legible theme um, for this particular website. And so that, I think, will be a, a pretty fun way of, of, getting you, um, of getting one of your photos up uh, and published on the Internet. And, of course, uh, I did pass out the, uh, the final project um, specifications two weeks ago. And just to give you a quick reminder, um, you might want to um, come up with several different ideas, uh, uh, or you might just want to um, come up with an idea that's representative of what you are interested in, in getting out of this particular class. And so it's not limited to just submitting regular photos. You can submit, for example, uh, um, like a magazine cover, if that sort of thing is what interests you. However, just one image may not be enough. You may have to submit several of them. You could submit, for example, a movie, a compilation of, of images into a movie, such as a stop motion animation or something similar to that. Even um, anything that you can imagine in terms of brochures or uh, uh, presentations, anything like that is, is certainly fine. The format doesn't really uh, 
um, matter all that much in, in terms of the end format. You will have to submit the actual JPEG files, the images themselves that make up that format, um, but in the end, none of that, um, uh, the end format shouldn't really matter. So whether you do this in uh, electronically, in an electronic form, such as a movie, or in print form, uh, that's certainly fine. Just remember that you will have to submit those photos electronically as well. Okay, so um, without further ado, I figure that we will go into um, talking about digital cameras, and I just want to fix my screen here so that, all right. Uh, we will start talking about um, digital cameras, but um, remember that a few uh, weeks ago we talked, we started talking about the dynamic range of a digital camera, and what is the dynamic range? What does that mean? Right, exactly. So it's the range from light to dark of what the camera is capable of capturing on the sensor. And in this uh, photo example of what is again an embarrassing photo that I for some reason show far too often in this class, is uh, di uh, the dynamic range of a scene that is too wide. There's too much dynamic range for the dynamic range capable by the sensor itself. So in other words, there's some dark shadow regions that are too dark for the sensor to be able to capture detail. And at the opposite end, there are some light highlight regions that are too bright for the camera to be able to capture detail. And I talked um, just very briefly about different sorts of dynamic ranges that you can expect from different cameras. Generally, from larger cameras, such as those from digital SLRs, you can get quite a few more stops of dynamic range out of, a, out of a scene than you can from a smaller camera. And this may, it may make sense because, you know, in the sense that, well, digital SLRs, they're bigger, they're heavier, they're more expensive, so they should perform better. But there's actually a very good reason for this to happen as well. So if you remember, when I started talking about dynamic range in a more quantitative, in a more concrete way, I said that uh, we could use this analogy of a bucket that's collecting rainwater, and we're trying to measure the amount of water that, that has fallen into this bucket. So the analogy, of course, is talking about a pixel being a bucket, but light is coming down and filling this bucket as rain comes down and fills this particular bucket. So in, in terms of this, how do we define the dynamic range? So we had, so the definition that we had in the last slide is correct, it's just not a quantitative way of describing the dynamic range. How can we quantitatively describe the dynamic range of this particular pixel or this particular bucket? So we're talking about the range from the maximum amount to the minimum amount. So you might be able to say, okay, well, there's definitely a maximum amount of, of water that I can fill on this bucket before it gets too full, spills over, then I won't be able to capture any more information. I know it's full, but other than that, I don't know how full or how much, how much over full it is, if that makes sense. But then there's also a minimum where I can say, okay, it rained just a little bit, but I can't put a measuring cup down there to really measure it because it's just not going to work very well. I see that there's some, there's a little bit in there, but it's just too little. So we can define this as being the maximum amount of photons or the maximum amount of, of water in the bucket divided by the minimum. And it's as simple as that. So however many uh, photons or, or droplets of water we're able to capture into this bucket divided by the minimum amount or the smallest amount that we are able to capture uh, or able to read actually in this particular uh, pixel or this bucket is the dynamic range of this particular sensor. And so keep in mind that when we're talking about this analogy, we're talking about you know one pixel in the millions of pixels that exist on a sensor. So to scale this out, you would have to imagine a huge array of buckets, you know, three 3,000 buckets wide by 2,000 buckets deep or something like that, and you have then you know, 6 million buckets that are all arranged in this very large area. Um, but this is, I mean, this is sort of the same thing that we're talking about. We have this very large array of pixels. 
and different amounts of light are falling onto different sections when we're measuring how much have, uh, has fallen onto each of these buckets. Now, in order for us to talk about this in a more concrete way, in terms of how this, uh, to, to remove the analogy from this and, and talk about how this impacts us in a greater sense to a digital cameras, we need to take yet another step back and talk about sensors themselves, to so talk about the big picture as, uh, of sensors themselves. And so realize that, uh, and this is probably obvious, but I should mention it anyway, that different cameras can have different sized sensors within them. So the sensors, for example, in your, in your compact camera or in your camera phone are considerably smaller than the sensors that you can find in a digital camera, or rather in a digital SLR, for example, which are generally much larger than those sensors found in digital cameras. Now, um, they come in all sorts of measurements. You will generally hear, for example, the full frame uh, digital SLR, sort of the, um, the goal or the, or the marker for all uh, digital photographers to try to achieve in terms of their equipment is the full frame 35 millimeter sensor. Now, as you go, as you start going down the line in terms of size, you will see compact cameras have different sizes of sensors as well. And they're named things like one divided by 2.7 inches, one divided by 1.8 inches, two thirds of an inch. And even though those sound very confusing, I have to tell you that it's even more so because that actually doesn't have that much to do with the size of the sensors themselves. So just to give you an example, if we take this two thirds uh, inch sensor uh, we, and we make a circle, we draw a circle with a diameter of two thirds, that's that circle. Then the actual sensor that, you know, the actual rectangle that's within there is the actual size of the sensor in the format called two thirds of an inch. So yeah, I know it's confusing and generally the way you can think of it is okay, well, take whatever size this is, it's about two thirds of that. So about 66% of that size and that's the diameter or rather the, uh, the diagonal of that particular sensor. It's not exact, it's not an exact science. Um, and the reason for this is actually, um, I think it has to deal with um, ancient, or not ancient, but decades old TV technology where the, the sensors uh, dealt with certain size tubes within, uh, within the cameras themselves. And this, the, this circle is the size of the tube and then the square part is the size of the sensor within it. It's complicated, I don't really understand, and it's a stupid, stupid, stupid system. They should do away with it, but it's here to stay as with everything else. So realize that you can at least get a general sense of the relative size of these sensors based on you know, how, how big they, they, they declare themselves to be in terms of the type. You can almost always get the actual sensor size in terms of millimeters from your camera specification book or from reviews online. It's, it's generally uh, you don't have to rely on this information as being sort of the end-all be-all of the sensor size. You can actually get the raw sensor size from your camera. Um, and just to, um, to give you an idea, uh, let's see, I do have somewhere around here, um, let's see, different sensor sizes that exist, okay. And um, you'll notice that these really vary quite wildly. So here's uh, just uh, an example of some of the sensor sizes that we have. I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger so it's more legible. So we have starting at sort of the low end, and there's probably smaller than this. We have one divided by 3.6 inches, uh, and we get a sensor size that is four millimeters wide by three millimeters high. So that's pretty, that's really small, very, very tiny. Uh, and then at the opposite end, we have 35 millimeter which has a very, very large size of 36 millimeters wide by 24 inches tall. So that's quite a big difference in the sensor size between a 35 millimeter full frame camera and a compact camera. And I hate to say it, but in terms, in terms of digital photography or photography in, as a whole, size does matter. So the bigger sensor you have, you are generally going to get more options in terms of the quality that you can get or what you are capable of doing with that particular sensor. So while there is a lot of abstraction in terms of the f-stop and, and the way that they make all of these numbers similar across each of these different cameras, um, there is actually a big difference between cameras that have a very small sensor 
compared to cameras that have much larger sensors. And that is mostly what we are going to be talking about today. Any questions on this stuff? OK. Now, um, in addition to these small compact camera sizes, there's also various sizes within digital SLRs as well. So just because it's a digital SLR doesn't mean that you're going to get a full frame 35 millimeter uh, sensor. You might get, depending on the type of camera that it is, you might get something else, something called, like if you're on the Nikon side, Nikon DX, for example. Or if you're on the Canon side, APS-C. Or you might get something else called APS-H or some of these other various sensor sizes that exist today. And if you're really curious, you can, of course, look up what these sizes mean uh, in, in real terms on a table such as this. You can literally just Google around for, a, for camera sensor sizes, and then you'll be able to find tables like this, not only on dpreview.com, but Wikipedia. They're all over the place. Anyway, um, the APS-C sensor size is actually smaller as well from the 35 millimeter full frame uh, sensor. So whereas the full frame is 36 millimeters by 24 millimeters, uh, the, the APS-C is generally around 25 by 16 or something like that. It actually varies uh, from manufacturer to manufacturer how large that particular sensor is. And that is, again, very important to us. Now, one last thing that I want to point out as well is the aspect ratio of these sensors. So these very large sensors here, so the APS-C 35 millimeter and the, what's called a medium format 645 sized uh, sensor, um, all have an aspect ratio of 3 to 2, well, I guess except this medium format, where it's more square, and it, shares this me this, and it shares the aspect ratio of these smaller sensors from compact cameras of 4 to 3. And just to give you an idea, if you remember the, the old school TVs, that, uh, you know, the very large ones that were sort of square, those were also 4 by 3 aspect ratio. So that's, it's sort of a square aspect ratio compared to these slightly wider, but not too much wider, um, digital SLR formats. And so that can be important. And it can be a bit of a shock if you go from a compact camera to a digital SLR and you suddenly realize, well, it's not, the frame isn't quite as tall as I thought. It's a little bit wider than, I, than I'm used to. That is certainly the reason why. It's this aspect ratio that has changed from one sensor size to another. OK. Now, when we are talking about sensor sizes, I want to give you an, an idea of the difference in the size. So I can throw out numbers at you all day and say, OK, well, take a look at this 2 thirds sensor. It's only 8.8 .8 millimeters by 6.6 .6 millimeters versus a 35 millimeter camera, which is something like 36 millimeters by 24. And that doesn't give you a good idea of the actual difference in size. Well, to scale, I've painstakingly drawn out two um, rectangles that show you approximately how much larger a digital SLR format sensor is compared to that of a compact camera. So on the left, we have a compact sensor uh, from a format called 1 divided by 2.5 inches. It's kind of small. Then on the right, we have an APS-C sensor. So it's not a full frame sensor still. It's not actually 35 millimeters, but it's a little bit smaller than that. And this is something that you would typically find in, um, in low to mid-range digital SLRs. So the very, very expensive, you know, $8,000 digital cameras will generally have full frame ones. But the ones that are more accessible to all of us are more likely to be this size. And this shows you the difference in size between these two formats. And um, you may know that one of the aspects of this course is that you don't have to have a digital SLR to complete all of the assignments. In fact, we, you can use um, the, uh, the Panasonic camera that's available from the Church Street Lab to be able to take the photos and complete the assignments. But just to show you that even we here at uh, the Ascension School are on a budget, um, we were not able to get cameras that have something that has a sensor that is that big. In fact, the sensor in the Panasonic Lumix is this exact sensor. It's a 1 divided by 2.5 inch camera. So if you are using that camera, um, you, are, you are using a compact digital camera that has features that mimic that of a digital SLR. Okay, but one of the things that I really want to get down to here is actually talking about the difference of these sensors. So here, I've given them both a megapixel count. They're each six megapixels in size. So this means that if they have an aspect ratio of three to two, then each one is going to have 3,000 pixels across 
by 2,000 pixels down. If you multiply those two out, you get 6 million pixels. And that's, that's why I chose 6 megapixels. It's very easy to, uh, to remember 3,000 by 2,000. So we have 3,000 pixels across on this one, 2,000 pixels down. And again, the same thing here, 3,000 pixels across and 2,000 pixels down. And if you actually do the math, if you figure out, if you take the width of each of these, divide it by 2,000, you can figure out exactly how large each pixel is on this sensor. So we do the math, and I've already done it for you. We, on the left side, we take 0 0.007 meters divided by 3,000, and we actually get 2.3 microns, which is 0 0.000023 meters. So it's very, very, very small. And just to give you an idea, the width of its typical human hair is about 100 microns. So 1 50th the, the width of the human hair is one pixel in this tiny little LCD. Very, very small. We're talking really small, very microscopic sizes here. Now, even though this one is much bigger, it's not a lot better. It, it is considerably better, but it's not, it's not a lot better. If we, take, um, if we take the width here, divide it again by 3,000 because they have the same resolution, so we're, we're going to expect the pixels to be larger. But this one on the right is now 8 microns. So whereas the pixel on the left is only 2.3 microns, the one on the right, the pixel on the right, is now 8 microns large. Now, if you, um, if you figure out the area of each of these pixels, now remember that one of the very important things about photography is, for example, the area of the lens, you know, that the, the, the size of the lens that's allowing the light to enter into the camera. The, if, you have, if you double the area, you're letting in twice as many photons, which means you're getting more light, which is generally a good thing, right? Because then your camera doesn't have to work as hard to try to generate an image from that particular lens. So if we figure out the area of one pixel on each of these, so it's just a tiny little fraction of each of these, then we find out that the area of one pixel on the left is four microns versus the area of a pixel on the right is 64 microns. So this is 16 times larger if you, if you multiply it by two. So four times two is eight, times two is 16, times two is 32, times two is 64. We get four stops more light in the sensor on the right. Just by having a larger sensor with the same number of megapixels, we get four times more light that's available to us to do whatever the hell we want with. So this means that we could do a couple of things. What could we do with this extra light? So let's talk about maybe ISO, for example. Maybe our sense of, yep. Right, so even though the camera manufacturers sort of normalize all of this so that ISO 100 on one digital camera that's this size is approximately equal to ISO 100 on a camera of this size, you can imagine that because ISO 100 on this camera is already getting so much more light, four t or rather 16 times more light, four stops more light of information than this one, that it's just going to be cleaner. It's going, there's going to be more signal and less noise. And this is exactly what happens. Now, there are other factors involved here. When I'm talking about sensor size, I'm assuming that technology hasn't advanced at all for either sensor. So we're assuming that the same, this is the same sensor technology developed side by side at the same amount of time. Newer sensors perform better. So as uh, with time, the compact cameras have gotten better for the, the quantity of megapixels that they have, so that they're a little bit less noisy, they have, um, they have uh, better signal to noise, variety of other things. And so what I'm talking about is keeping all other things except the size of the sensor itself constant. Because as technology progresses, it sort of throws a wrench into all of this, and we have to try to figure out again what all of this, uh, what all of this means, or what all of this does. Okay, so you're starting to see, hopefully, what the difference in sensor size can do to the quality of our images. But there's something else that it impacts as well.
And that deals with the actual light itself. So the, the actual optical properties of the lens, um, or rather, that's, that, that is probably not accurate to say, but the actual image that it captures, if we're using the same lens, for example, is different. So imagine for a moment that I just have a lens. I don't care what the focal length is, I don't care what the aperture is, anything like that. Just pretend you have one lens and you put it in position over this sensor right here. Then you take a photo using that lens with that sensor, okay? You have a particular photo. Let's say it is of this room, for example. Now, let's say you move that same lens over to this sensor right here on the left and take another photo of the same location, the same lighting, everything is the same except the sensor. You've just changed the sensor. How, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. How does the, diff how does the image actually look different? So not, not brighter, so it's the same amount of light. So we're, we're, how, what about the image itself? So, so less defined, so that is a possibility. It depends on the optical properties of the lens. But imagine that we have a lens and it's projecting an image onto this square, or onto that rectangle right there. Then we move it over, it's projecting the same image over here, but we're only capturing a smaller portion of it. So that means that we are essentially cropping the center of that image for this smaller sensor right here. Okay, does that make sense? So that now, rather than being a picture of the entire room, for example, we put this lens on this, on front of, in front of the smaller sensor, we get a much narrower field of view, maybe only the center few chairs, for example, or maybe just the door in the back, as an example. And that is exactly what happens. And so you might remember this particular image um, from when I was talking about perspective back in the optics lecture, but we can reuse this image when we're talking about the difference in sensor sizes. Okay, so let's imagine, so just to give you a quick reminder of what, this, what these images were showing you, we had four images here. What we were trying to show was the difference in perspective when we moved the camera closer or farther away from some set of objects. So in the first picture, we took an image on a camera at 35 millimeters. And so again, you can imagine that this is like taking, uh, taking a picture with that large sensor with some particular image. Then we cropped the center part using this, you know, that little red box. We cropped the center out, blew it up a little bit, and looked at how that looked like. And that is right here. Then we removed that lens, this original lens that we used to get this particular shot, number one. We put a longer lens on it, which means it's more zoomed in, more telephoto. We took the photo again, we got this third image right here. And recall that this third image and the second image are essentially identical. Well, except for the resolution, because you've lost resolution by cropping some of it out. But the, how it looks, the field of view, the perspective of the two hasn't changed. So it looks exactly the same. OK, so if you think about how we can reapply the same image, the same thing applies to smaller sensors as well. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. OK, so let's say that image number one we took with that particular lens in front of this large sensor right here. Then we, just, we looked at the, the image on our computer screen, and number one is the image that we got. OK, now let's say that we moved over that lens from this large sensor, put it in front of this smaller sensor, and took another photo. It is as if we have, we're t we've cropped out this red portion of the image again, and we're looking at this. So it's essentially the same thing. Does that make sense? So what we are, what we are saying is that, OK, well, using this lens, this 33 millimeter lens, on this small sensor is as if we are using a much longer lens on this larger sensor. Everybody with me so far? Okay, so a longer lens, or I'm sorry, a shorter lens on a smaller sensor is more zoomed in versus a larger lens, uh, or versus that same small lens, 
you know, when I say small, I mean short lens. Same short lens on a larger sensor is more zoomed out. And so this brings up this notion, this idea of something called um, the field of view crop or a crop factor or, or a, you might hear a variety of different things um, that, are, that are out on the internet uh, lately. And that is discussing the actual difference of using one of these cropped sensors, so one of these APS-C digital SLR sensors, for example, that have a smaller sensor than a full frame digital SLR sensor. They're talking about um, the difference in the field of view from one sensor to another. And this has a variety of implications uh, to us. So one of them is that if we are using a crop factor camera or, or a, a digital SLR that has a smaller sensor than full frame, then it alters how our images will look. And, and more specifically, it, it's cropping out the center of those particular images. Now, um, there's, there's a lot of arguments to be said about this particular, um, this particular notion of photography, and it's hard for me to address all of them, um, but realize that this really only becomes true when the megapixels or the quantity of, of pixels is the same in each sensor, and I'll explain that in a second. Yes? I realize I, I actually am kind of confused. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so it's, so it, it is, all right. So it is correct to say that it is as if it is cropping the photo. So when you, when you move that so lens. From one to two, not from one to three. One to, uh, no, not exactly. Because in, in this precise example here, um, one, so we had, if we had six megapixels in this first image, for example, when we actually cropped out in software that red box, then we had a much smaller number of pixels in this image right here, right? But what we are talking about is using a smaller sensor that has more pixels, so it's denser. So that means that now when we move this lens to a smaller sensor, this red box, rather than having less resolution, now has the same resolution uh, as the original photo, but has the field of view of the original cropped photo, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So it's an important distinction um, to say that when we are using um, one lens that's designed for a larger sensor, when we're using that same lens, on a smaller sensor, it's not as though, so even though it alters the field of view so that it's, it's, you know, as, it's as if we are using a longer lens, we are not using a longer lens. We are still using however many millimeters of focal length that is. It's just that we, are happy, we happen to crop out the center of that image circle. And that is what I'm trying to show with this image here. So lenses, as you know, are circular. And when light passes through them, they, um, it passes the image through in a circular fashion. So this, the image circle, as it's called, of the lens looks like this big circle. Now, if I have a full frame camera, or I'm using a film camera that has a legitimate 35 millimeter frame, I use as much of that uh, image circle as I possibly can when I'm taking the image. So using this red box, for example, uh, I'm taking that photo with a full frame digital camera and the image that you see within this red box is the resulting image in the full frame digital camera. Now let's say that I move that same lens onto a crop camera, onto an APS-C camera that's going to be a little bit smaller than the full frame camera. What I see then from this entire image circle, I'm wasting all of this extra information provided to me from this lens, but I'm getting this center part cropped out of the image. And if these two cameras have the same resolution, then it is, is, as, it is as if I have zoomed in a little bit more um, for free with this lens. Of course, it's not quite for free because as we know, 
The same resolution means that the pixels are smaller, so it's a little bit noisier than a much larger sensor that's going to have uh, cleaner pixels, but is going to be more zoomed out. So as you can see, there's, as with most things, photography, a lot of give and take here. So if we have, for example, a wide angle lens, we're trying to take a photo of the entire room, for example, we generally want that wide angle lens on the full frame camera because then we get as much of the room as that lens will allow me to have as possible in the photo. So using a cropped camera, we're getting rid of some of those, the wide angleness, so to speak, of that particular lens. So we can battle with this. So how, let's say that I put a wide angle lens on a full frame digital camera and I'm able to capture this entire room in that photo. Now I move that same lens over to a cropped camera. I take a photo again. It's going to give me less of the room, right? So how can I battle with that? How can I get, not with that same lens of course, but how can I get all of the room into this camera that has a smaller sensor? Yep, so we need a wider angle lens. So this means that for this smaller sensor, we have to design a new lens that has a shorter fo focal length, which allows me now to match the width or the field of view from that original combination in this smaller camera. And so just to give you another, uh, just to hammer this, this point home even more, um, I know there's a lot of like boxes and lines and stuff, but if you work through this image, it's not all that complicated. So let's say that we put a 50 millimeter lens, for example, on two cameras. First, a full frame camera, this red box, then an APS-C camera or a cropped camera, which is the blue box. Now, when you actually look at those photos on the computer, you see this very top image for the, from the full frame camera, and you see this image from the, crop, from the cropped camera. So remember when, you, when you're viewing these photos on your computer, you generally view them at about the same size, right? So maybe full screen, for example. So when you blow up this image to be the size of your screen, then it's going to look more zoomed in as the full frame one. So this is the same thing that we've been talking about, just another way of demonstrating this same, this same idea. Now, however, let's say that we try to adjust for the fact that we're using a, uh, a long focal length or a, a medium focal length lens on a smaller sensor by using a longer lens on a larger sensor, we can see that now with the 70 millimeter lens, it's going to be slightly more zoomed in and the end result is a photo that looks approximately the same as that shorter lens on the smaller sensor. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Now this is something that's very important and this is a very heated debate on the internet. Once you start um, looking into some of the, the more expensive cameras when you're trying to decide between a cropped sensor camera such as an Icon DX or an APS-C from Canon versus a full frame camera which is available again from both and, and there are other manufacturers as well that offer these, you will very frequently see this become a religious debate online about how Oh, full frame, that's the way to go. If you don't have that, you're an amateur, you don't know what you're doing, so on and so on and so forth. And that's not necessarily true, I don't think. It's, it's different strokes for different folks, if, if you'll let me uh, coin a very cliched phrase. And the, the whole reason um, that a crop sensor might be better, if it has a higher resolution, then you might be able to get the equivalent of a longer lens for cheaper. So if, for example, you do a lot of sports or bird photography, for, for example, or airplanes or something where you need a lot of reach, then maybe you want a slightly smaller sensor for that reason. Now, it's not really all that useful if you have a small sensor and not as much resolution as the full frame sensor, because then you might as well purchase the full frame sensor um, and use that resolution and just crop out the center, because that's the same thing anyway, right? So if you have, let's say, a 12 megapixel sensor here and a, only like a 4 megapixel sensor here, for example, just to show an extreme, then you're not going to get more resolution out of this smaller sensor. So you're not going to get as much reach. It's not going to be as if you are, are zooming in as much. You're just 
you're just losing this image circle and you lose the advantage, of, well, the supposed advantage of this cropped sensor. Now there's another way to look at this as well. Using a high resolution full frame sensor, you have the most options. You could use the widest angle lenses that are available. You can crop when you need to and get that reach. You get the most uh, quality out of it that's available at that particular time. So it's really, I mean, as, as I always say, uh, with regards to digital photography, it's, you have to decide which way is best for you. And, and I think, at least for now, um, many of us will still be choosing the crop sensor only, if nothing else, but for cost, because it is, we can still get these crop sensors for considerably cheaper than we can, for, uh, than we can these much larger sensors. Okay, now, if this, this applies to pretty much every type of camera, that's available on the market today. So this is a front photo uh, of the Panasonic Lumix that's available again from the Church Street Lab. And I'm using this only as an example because some of you may have used this camera, maybe, maybe, familiar, maybe familiar with how it behaves or how it operates. And you'll notice that on the front, and this is something that we went over in the optics lecture, there's a variety of information available. So not only is it the f-stop range, or the, the F number range that's available um, uh, on that lens, we also get to see the focal length itself. So on this lens, for example, we see that we get a focal length of six millimeters, and I know it's upside down, so you have to turn your heads over, from six millimeters at the widest end, all the way to 72 millimeters at the most telephoto end. Now, generally what we see online is a conversion from these small focal lengths, because keep in mind, this is the actual focal length of the lens. It's actually a six millimeter to 72 millimeter lens, but because the sensor on this camera is so small, it's as if this is a much longer lens on a 35 millimeter camera. And generally, we try to normalize this information by converting it back to a 35 millimeter equivalent. And frequently, you will see that in reviews or in specifications, you will see something that says, uh, the actual focal length is shown here, then they do a conversion and show you and tell you what it would be if you were using similar focal lengths on a 35 millimeter camera. And this is useful for us because then we can start to get an idea of how wide or how telephoto something is uh, just by knowing this equivalency. So we don't have to, um, we, don't act we don't actually have to guess how wide six millimeters is. And there's actually a way that we can multiply it out. And so in this case, this particular lens operates in the 35 millimeter equivalent from 36 millimeters, which is sort of wide, but not really, all the way to 432 millimeters. And if you're familiar with digital SLRs or 35 millimeter cameras, then you will know that buying a 400 millimeter lens is not only big, but it will probably be the only purchase you make that year because it is so expensive, it is so heavy, you're going to have chronic back problems trying to carry it around. It's going to be a big hassle. So we can simulate having a very, very long lens by using one of these smaller sensors and using a shorter lens as well. Now, how did we calculate this, um, this particular figure from this? Well, you have to know how many times smaller that particular sensor is compared to 35 millimeters. So when we are talking about, for example, an APS-C sensor or a DX sensor, if we take one of these sides, 24 millimeters, and we compare it to the actual size of a 30 millimeter camera, so here, let's see, uh, I, I meant 35 millimeter camera, if that's not what I said, we see the width of this sensor on a 35 millimeter camera is 36 millimeters. Now we can look at this crop sensor. Mm we find out that it's 24 millimeters. So if you just, if you simply take, now the, um, uh, let's see, open up a calculator here. If you take the size of the 35 millimeter frame, 36 millimeters, divide it by the width of the smaller frame, you find out exactly the multiplication factor or just how much smaller that particular sensor is. So the crop sensor, is 1.5 times smaller. That means that if I am using a 50 millimeter lens on the crop sensor, 
it's as if I'm using a 75 millimeter lens on the 35 millimeter camera. Now, similarly, we can figure out the same thing with this Panasonic camera. So we again take 36 millimeters, the size of the full frame sensor. We find out the width of the Panasonic lens. And let's see, I said it was a, um, it's not on this particular one. So I said it was seven millimeters in this case. So I'll take 36 millimeters, divide it by seven millimeters. We find out that it's about five times smaller. So it's five times smaller than the 35 millimeter camera. So then all I have to do is very simply multiply that focal length range that's on the front by about five. So six times five is going to be about 30. 72 times five, it's going to be about 420 or so. So you will see that, uh, that I was more precise when I did the calculation before. But this is how you can figure out the equivalency. And you can normalize this information from one camera to another, which can be very, very useful. OK, let's take a quick five minute break. And when we come back, we'll, we will continue talking about digital cameras. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. So hopefully now my voice won't be quite so crazy as it was the first hour. John was kind enough to give me some water. And so now hopefully I'll be able to talk with even more enthusiasm about all of these wonderful topics. So, um, so as you recall from the first hour, we were talking about how using smaller sensors requires us to, do, to make some sacrifices. So we either have to use uh, shorter lenses in order to get the same field of view or to capture the same amount in a particular image, or we have to be able to uh, increase the sensitivity, for example, of a particular sensor in order to get as much uh, brightness, so to speak, or as much signal out of that particular size. And so just to uh, uh, hammer this point home, and actually to, and as a teaser, there's going to be a part of this lecture that's probably going to completely blow your mind, where we will hopefully dispel uh, a myth of, of compact cameras versus digital SLRs. Uh, I want to again show you this particular two-scale uh, image of, a, of the different sized sensors. However, there's a difference. So this is, these are exactly the same. These are the same size sensors that we saw before. But the difference this time is in the resolution of the two sensors. So in this case now, we have the sensor on the left is only 0.5 megapixels versus the sensor on the right, which is 6 megapixels. And if you do the math, you realize that the one on the left, so while the one on the right still continues to have 3,000 pixels across, 2,000 pixels down, the one on the left now has much fewer. It has about 875 pixels across by about 571 pixels down. But the reason that this is important is that now the pixels, each pixel is the exact same size between the two sensors. So <clears throat> now we, we really have cropped out the center part of this large sensor. We took, we took the middle portion of it and we put it over here. And that is exactly what we have. We have the same size pixels. So now we get a sort of different uh, um, uh, result from what happened previously, where we talked about two differently sized sensors that had the same number of megapixels. So let's again go through our thought experiments where we had one lens uh, and we put that lens in front of each sensor. So we put up that lens in front of the sensor on the right. We get again a picture of the entire room, for example. Now let's say that we put that, that same lens on the sensor to the left. And what happens now? What do we see in our image? Yep, so it's just the center. But everything else being equal, it's going to look exactly the same. It's just going to be as if we have cropped out the center 0.5 megapixels from the original image or from the image of the larger sensor. Now, um, you may say, well, OK, this seems sort of silly. Why on earth would we do this? Well, keep in mind, again, that the pixels are now the exact same size. So now what we have is that um, each pixel on the left receives just as, much pic just as much light as each pixel on the right. And this means that we can get just as much quality out of both. But at the expense of what? The resolution. So whereas now we're able to keep 
the same amount of, of signal that we had originally, we lose the resolution, we lose the field of view, we lose a good number of things that were available on the sensor at the right. Okay, so conversely, imagine that we had, we revert back to this smaller sensor that has the higher number of megapixels, the six megapixels. We talked about how each pixel now um, actually has to deal with uh, less amount of light. So because they're, they're actually smaller, they get fewer photons that reach each pixel. So if we were to continue designing a camera uh, that is going to be representatively smaller on the left side than the one on the right. So let's say that we just designed a camera on the, on the right side where we could take an image of the entire room and then now we want to design a camera uh, that, where we can take an image of the entire room for a sensor on the left. So this means that we have to make the focal length shorter in order to get more of the image in. And this actually has an impact on more than just the width of the image. And so just to give you an idea of what we are going to be talking about, um, what are some of the features or some of the, uh, or some of the impacts of using a compact digital camera versus a larger one, and I'm talking about how the image itself might look. So when we're talking about a compact digital camera versus a digital SLR, in your mind and, and sort of typically what would you expect would be the difference between the two if we took an image? So at the same settings, so they're exposed the same, they have the same field of view, do the images differ at all? Really, nobody has any ideas how they would look different. Okay, so let's say that we set both to an F number of 2.8. So those of you that are familiar with compact digital cameras, what maybe you have looked at larger format cameras with maybe a sense of awe or wonderment about the images. So what makes those SLR uh, images look different? Depth of field, okay, good, yeah. So, Typically, we expect compact cameras to have a much larger depth of field for the same F number. So if we have, if we make everything else the same, we use the same ISO, same shutter speed, the same F number, but we have two cameras side by side, where really the only difference now um, is that they're two separate, well, okay, that's a big difference, but if they're two separate cameras, but they're of the same scene, they're exposed exactly the same, you would expect the smaller camera to have a much larger depth of field. But I have to say that this is something of a myth. To think that digital SLRs cannot have the same depth of field is actually a myth that's been propagated probably because of, of how we think of F numbers. So when we think of F numbers, we know that it's a ratio of what? I know I'm making you guys work today. You're like, come on, it's Monday, but yes. What's the F, F number? Ratio of? Yeah, focal length and diameter. Okay, good. So now when we're dealing with the, the same F number across different uh, cameras, we might sometimes see a difference of something like this, where one camera has very wide um, uh, or very large depth of field, and the other camera does not. But what does, if you remember that, that this F number actually is a ratio of this focal length and this diameter, you'll realize that some things have changed. First of all, in this smaller sensor, in order to get the same field of view, to, so in order to capture the same width of this particular ruler, we have to use a much shorter focal length. So that means if we're using a shorter focal length, and we have the same F number between the two cameras, something else has changed as well. And what is that? Not the ISO, I'm talking about the lens itself. Yeah, the diameter of, of the lens. So the actual aperture, the size of the aperture has shrunk as well. So not only has the lens become smaller because the focal length is smaller, but the aperture has shrunk as well. Now, this image shows that there is um, not actually a significant difference between compact camera and a digital SLR in terms of 
the depth of field that is possible. Now, this tells you something very, very important, and that is that digital SLRs of the same year, basically of the same amount of technology as their counterpart compact cameras, are capable of not only very short depth of field so that you can get nice, blurry, creamy backgrounds, they are also capable of the same thing that compact digital cameras are as well. So when you take a photo with a compact digital camera, you have a sort of range of F numbers that, that you are allowed to use. Keep in mind that the, that that is only a subset of what digital SLRs are capable of doing. And that is what this image is trying to show us. Now, if we try to go over this, and there's, and there's actually on the website, there's a link to uh, an article written by, um, by a, a guy named Roger Clark. And he goes into excruciating detail about why this is. And I guarantee you will have to read this article several times in order to, to understand it. Um, but I will try to, to describe why this happens. So let's say that we have two cameras. We have a digital SLR and we have a compact camera. And so just for the sake of argument, uh, and to try to keep as many things as similar as possible, they'll be from the same manufacturer, in this case Canon. They'll be from the same era of technology, so they were released at about the same time, which means that really the, the, the differences between them are the size of the sensor and the size of the lens. Of course, there's differences in the electronics themselves and the features, but we're not worried about that stuff. We're actually worried about the optics itself, or the optical path as the light enters into the camera. So here, and the very bottom and very top images, realize that these are three separate images, and I know they're sort of stacked almost confusingly on top of each other. On the, uh, the top most and bottom most images, we have a Canon 1D, which is, um, it's not quite full frame, but it's, it's, it's just ever so slightly smaller than a full frame sensor. And we're using a lens that is 28 millimeters at an aperture of about f3.5. Okay, now on the Canon camera, we are using a much smaller sensor, and, and in order to get the same field of view, remember we have to shorten the, uh, the lens itself, and so we are using, rather than a 28 millimeter lens, we're using an eight millimeter lens, and we get the same amount within the, uh, the, same amount within the, um, within the image, the same amount of, of, the, of the scene. Now it's important also to note that these two also have approximately the same amount of megapixels. So they're both about eight megapixels, I think. So that means that the pixels on this image or on this camera are much, much, much smaller than the ones in the larger Canon SLR. Okay, so we take an image. So we try to keep things relatively the same. Uh, we take an image at about ISO 50 here and about ISO, uh, uh, well, let's see, oh, okay, so if we take an image at ISO um, 640, which is a lot larger, then we get a certain shutter speed, but you see that keeping the F number the same at 3.5, it looks as though this uh, image in the middle, the, the compact digital camera, has much larger depth of field. But what's important here is not the number, the F number ratio, it is the size of the aperture itself. So if we calculate how much smaller the aperture is in this one, because keep in mind that the lens, the focal length is shorter, so that means the aperture had to shrink as well, we find out that this aperture is about, I think, 2.2 uh, times smaller than the aperture that is here. And that's, I'm just talking about the diameter itself. And that happens to be also the difference in the size of the sensors as well. So the one, this Canon camera here is about uh, 2.2 times smaller in terms of the crop factor. So if we make up for this difference, if we try to figure out exactly how much smaller or how much less light this smaller aperture is letting in, we do some calculations and we realize that what was 3.5 over here is now F13 up top. Okay, so this means that now between these two cameras, we have the exact same size aperture. We have different sized lenses, but that's because um, we have to try to get the same field of view or the same amount of information within both. But now that we have stopped down this, um, 
now that we have stopped down this lens to have a smaller aperture, what do we have to do to try to get a still a reasonably fast shutter speed? Increase something. Yep, so if we increase the ISO, then we will be able to recoup that shutter speed. And in fact, if you were to carefully study the two images, uh, you would be able to determine that these two images have just about the same amount of noise. Even though we increased the ISO, you notice that we went from uh, 50 to 640. So um, let's see, OK. So we can do this math. Uh, 50 divide root this. OK, so three point, let's see. So we, what we got uh, when we made, oh, come on. When we stopped down the aperture by a certain amount, we got a certain amount less light that was entering into the camera. However, it's the same number of photons now that are hitting both sensors. Because it's the same size aperture, this means that the same number of photons are entering into both uh, cameras at the same time, which means that if we increase the ISO, we get about the same noise, the, about the same amount of noise that we did in the smaller sensor. So we get then, in the end, um, the ability to mimic a much smaller sensor just by using not only a higher ISO, but also a smaller aperture, because now we are making all of these things approximately equal, approximately the same. So this is um, understandably kind of confusing. And, and, uh, but again, just to reiterate this, what's important to realize is that compact digital cameras, even though they traditionally have been thought to have a much larger depth of field, it's really only because everything is smaller. And with that, smallness uh, comes also this decrease in size of the aperture itself, which means a couple of things happen. We get a large, longer depth of field, but also we get fewer photons that enter. So this smaller sensor is at a disadvantage because it has, just by nature, with the same F number, fewer photons entering into the lens. And this would make perfect sense if you looked at the size uh, the size difference between each of these lenses. You have a big SLR lens, it's going to let in a lot of light, and you have a small compact camera lens, and it's not going to let in as much light. So um, in order to battle this, the camera manufacturers have to essentially increase the sensitivity of these, uh, of these smaller sensors to try to get everything else to be the same. So in order to get the same, uh, in order to use the same F number and the same uh, shutter speed and the same ISO, this means they have to boost the sensitivity, which makes them noisier. So for the same amount of technology, with, uh, the size really does matter. The, the bigger you go, the more light you will have, uh, the better the quality you will have. But of course, this comes at the expense of size, weight, expense in terms of, of the cost of, of the system and all of, and all of its little doodads and stuff that you have to buy for it. So it is, of course, a trade-off. Um, and again, the compact camera is just a subset of, the, of what is possible with the larger um, SLR cameras. Now, um, we've been talking about um, pixel size and about how when we change the size of the sensor and try to keep the megapixels the same, or the, the quantity of pixels on that sensor the same size, um, we get a decrease in maybe the, in the amount of signal or in the amount of light that we're able to hold. And we can imagine this. If we go back to our analogy of the buckets, let's say that we have a sensor, uh, an SLR size sensor that has a very, you know, has six megapixels, it has very large buckets. And we have something that looks like this, where we can fill up those buckets with these four photons. Uh, well, not fill it up, but we fill it up to a, about this amount. So what's happening is that we get a certain amount of light that enters into the, um, into the camera uh, and onto the sensor, and we're able to record so much of that. Now, if we have a much smaller bucket, as what would happen with a small sensor digital camera, it doesn't take as long to fill up that bucket, because this bucket is now narrower. It's not as wide. <laughs> 
it may be the same depth, if, even though there's no real analogy in terms of that. But uh, if we think about this sort of abstractly in terms of the width, if the same amount of, of light falls onto it, so if we have these four photons that falls onto it, it, it increases faster. But remember that these smaller compact cameras that have these smaller pixels usually also have the smaller apertures. They have the smaller lenses, which means the apertures themselves are smaller, which means that less light is coming in. So maybe we're going to get half as much light, for example. We typically get a lot less than that. But just as, as an example, we only get two photons in instead. And so now we see that it is about approximately the same level of brightness. And so even though it doesn't take as many photons, it's noisier. It's harder for us to measure from something that's not, from a bucket that's not as large. If we have a very, very large bucket, it's easier for us to try to measure the, the amount of water that's fallen into it. But if we have a very narrow, very small bucket, it's not going to be as easy for us to measure. So we're going to get significantly more amounts of noise from this sensor on the right. And so what is important here is it's, it's, what, it's something called the signal to noise ratio. So it's the amount of signal that we get compared to the amount of noise that it takes for us to try to read that particular signal. Now, um, if you are looking for a digital camera, I don't necessarily recommend that you do this, but something that's very interesting um, from an academic standpoint is something called uh, DxO Mark. So this is a company uh, where they go into excruciating quantitative detail about sensors themselves. And they try to capture um, a lot of information about the sensors that exist within digital cameras. And one of the things, so I'll just pick a, uh, let's see, this Nikon, for example. And they measure a number of things about these particular sensors as soon as it comes up, uh, including um, the dynamic range, how sensitive they are to light, how good their, um, their performance is with, in terms of color and in terms of uh, ISO sensitivity. And one of the things that you'll notice that's very interesting about a lot, of, um, a lot of digital cameras, so I'm just showing you this not really to uh, advertise any of these cameras, but just to show you some of the information that we can get from these sensors. Uh, you'll notice that if this gray line is sort of the optimal amount of sensitivity in terms of, you know, IS, let's say ISO 100, it's actually going to be as sensitive as, as a film level ISO 100. Just about every camera is not quite as sensitive um, as film is itself. And so we see this uh, on just about every digital camera. This is a way that they're able to cheat. And, and one of the things that we also see is a signal to noise ratio at uh, various ISO levels. And you'll see that this, there's a downward slope here. And I'll describe that uh, probably not today, but in probably the next lecture. This is something that's, um, that's very, very important to us. And the dynamic range as well. So we can see that this particular camera, which is an expensive um, Nikon camera, does have just, just about 12 stops of dynamic range. Now, um, if you let me go back to this, um, to this image here, Remember that I said that dynamic range is basically the division of the biggest signal or the, the most amount of photons that it is able to capture or the full bucket divided by the smallest signal that we can reasonably capture. So if we have two cameras, one that has a very wide bucket like this and can fill up on a lot of these photons versus a much smaller bucket that, can, that will fill up twice as quickly, we can see that we have much larger dynamic range out of this bucket just because it is a much larger bucket. We are able to get a bigger signal out of it. And um, this is very important as it relates to ISO and to dynamic range. Now, um, just to show you a few more things from this website, and again, this is, I think it's interesting to look at, but I'm not sure you should necessarily base purchase decisions off of this because it's getting into level of detail that just doesn't really matter, I think. I think a lot of modern digital cameras have very, very good, um, very good sensors. But this is useful, uh, I think, as, as a tool to understand how these cameras work and what is going on 
behind the scenes. So tonal range, as you remember, what's the difference between dynamic range and tonal range? I'm sorry? Uh, close, yes. So, uh, so whereas dynamic range deals with the range of light, so the maximum and, mi and minimum amount of light that we're able to cover, uh, tonal range, it's not quite colors, but it's, it's the amount of subtle gradations within that range. So if we have a very low tonal range, for example, from this very deep black to this very high white, then we'll sort of see a stepping stone of gray as it gets slightly lighter, slightly lighter, slightly lighter. But if we have a very large tonal range within this dynamic range, then we see a lot of the grays in between. So we just see this smooth gray change from this deep black to this bright white. So having both a dynamic range and a tonal range to match is important because if you have a very wide tonal range, it's not going to mean very much if when you see a color of a, of a nice uh, uh, sky, for example, it looks like there's a big blue splotch and then a slightly lighter blue splotch. That's just not going to cut it for us as photographers. So both of these is important. But of course, uh, color sensitivity as well. So this is something that's, that's actually just marked differently. Uh, and it's how sensitive a sensor might be to, uh, to various amounts of color. And as we'll see, this actually uh, can be impacted by the sensor itself. And of course, the, uh, the signal to noise ratio. So how much signal we're actually getting um, based on the amount of noise. And so there's a lot, of, a lot of religious debates on the internet. And as, if you do uh, research for, for digital cameras, you might, you might narrow it down based on features alone or based on price for a variety of your own factors that you have in mind. You might narrow it down to two, three, maybe four cameras. And then you'll probably start Googling for these cameras to see what's going to come up, see whether people like them, dislike them. And most people will probably come up with similar conclusions as you did and realize that there's a couple of cameras that are kind of in the same range. And most people will compare them. And a lot of times you get into these religious debates about megapixels and sensor sizes. And yes, this is very important, but it's, but it's also important to realize that it's more than just the pixel size itself that impacts the image quality. Now, in absolute terms, let's say that we get to a certain technological point where we just simply cannot advance in technology anymore. We just cannot get any better at, uh, at designing sensors or at, at being able to eliminate noise in sensors or a variety of, of other things. Now, that is when this sensor size or this pixel size is really absolutely going to matter. Another time this is going to matter is when you're looking at two cameras that were released at about the same time. And at the same level of technology, larger pixels will almost always be better than smaller pixels. But the way things are progressing, we kind of get into this, we kind of get into the point where um, we can make pixels slightly smaller and be able to get some good quality out of them. Now, in absolute terms, of course, it is the size of the pixels does matter. And uh, for the longest time, I always went into a very long rant in, in E7 about how, oh, the megapixel wards, it's really, really stupid. You should not pay any attention to megapixels. And, and to a certain degree, that's true today as well. But luckily, camera manufacturers are now seeing the light as well uh, in, in, in the same sort of thing. And in fact, um, Canon recently announced a compact camera along, it's a, within a certain line of compact cameras, and I forget exactly the model number, but in the newest model, they actually decreased the number of megapixels in that camera with the sole reason of getting larger pixels out of it and therefore getting better dynamic range, better low light performance out of that camera. And as we slowly reach the point of where we just cannot physically get any better data out of photons than what we have, and, and by the way, we are sort of reaching that point where sensors can, can detect, you know, a couple of photons. Like it's very, it's very impressive what these sensors are able to do. As we approach that point, then megapixels will matter in terms of smaller will be better because then you will have a larger pixel well, you'll be able to capture more light, you'll be able to get better quality. But there is something to be said about newer cameras that have maybe just slightly larger amounts of megapixels. And yes, um, 
I don't want you to get the wrong idea that more megapixels is better. That's not what I'm saying here at all. I just don't want you to get caught up again in these religious debates between, oh, it absolutely has to have fewer megapixels to have the absolute best quality possible. Sometimes there's other factors where they can get around that. They can have slightly better megapixels and be able to retain the same quality or maybe even increase the quality at the same time as well. And, and as you will see in the next lecture, um, there's, a, there's a couple of, of pretty obvious ways that they will be able to, to do this. Now, when we're talking about um, sensors themselves um, and the dynamic range within them, it's important to realize that these sensors can't actually become more sensitive, if that makes sense. So the fact that we have ISO is somewhat, only somewhat of a lie. And that is that these sensors, they pretty much are at maximum sensitivity when you turn them on. Um, but what happens when you increase the ISO is that it's, it's, it's sort of like it's cheating a little bit. So at ISO 100, for example, you are allowed uh, to fill up this entire bucket with light or with water, if you will. And you read all of this information from that bucket. Now what happens at ISO 200 is that it basically doubles all of the information within a pixel. It doesn't do this in, in electronics. It's done in, a, in an analog way. So it's, it's, sort of like, um, you know, it's sort of like turning up the gain on, a, on an amplifier, for example, or on an, uh, what you're doing is, is you're not actually making it, in this case, any more sensitive, but you're just making the data that you have matter more, if that makes sense. So what, what's happening is that you can think of it in terms of doubling all of this information that you have. So just imagine for a moment that for ISO 200, whereas for ISO 100 we were able to fill up this entire bucket, for ISO 200 now, we only fill it up halfway and we arbitrarily say that filling it up halfway, that's absolute white. That's, that's as bright as it's going to get. Because we can double now all of this information and things will appear to be twice as bright. Does that make sense? So rather than just having a one-to-one -one relationship of brightness now, in ISO 200 we can essentially double the brightness of everything and it's as if it is one stop brighter. Similarly for ISO 400 we can say okay well I will multiply everything by four and now that means that everything is going to be two stops brighter. Now um, realize that this is only somewhat true because as you use these, um, these smaller capacities for the ISO, uh, you actually get almost for free um, a decrease in the amount of noise. So it's not as bad as, as this might look, that every time you're increasing the ISO, you're, you're decreasing it by half. Um, it's actually a little bit less than that. And if we take a look at a lot of the data, that exists within um, uh, this sort of technology, we see that this is actually very close to true. So at ISO 100 and 200, it's very close. But as we start going down, we can see that we're losing a number of stops of dynamic range. And it's almost one stop of dynamic range every time we increase the ISO on, on this digital camera. So this means that to get the best quality, you have to use the lowest ISO that's possible. Now, using or having about uh, nine, eight, even seven stops of information is passable. That's certainly fine because compact cameras do it all the time and it's not that big of a deal. But you're not using all of the quality that's available to your camera. So this is not meant to scare you away from using higher ISOs, of course, because you have to in order to take uh, photos with a reasonable shutter speed or with a reasonably small aperture, but this is just to show you what happens within the digital camera when you do increase the ISO, is that you are losing dynamic range because of the way that the camera is reading the data from the sensor. So as you increase the ISO, it's reading less data, it's considering like this half, for example, to be brightest white, and it's just going to be doubling this information that exists within the sensor. So, um, and again, it's not a full stop because other noise levels do decrease while you increase the ISO, but you are losing uh, 
some of this quality that you used to have. And if you remember, when we're talking about having these um, smaller buckets, you can see that now that fewer photons are capable of being stored in these smaller buckets, increasing the ISO is even more harmful to a smaller camera than it is to a larger camera. So generally, having the biggest pixel that you possibly can is, is a very good thing, but we are to the point where that's not the end-all be-all. It, it is something to, to uh, pay attention to, but it's not um, sort of the most important thing to keep in mind. Now, um, so increasing the ISO can be a dangerous thing to your, um, uh, to your image quality, but many times you won't even be able to notice the difference in, in the photos. Having just one stop of difference is, isn't necessarily going to be as much as you would think when you look at it. Now, when you get to these very high ISOs, you know, around 3200, 6400, that's when you will begin to tell the difference from these ISOs, from these, uh, from these topmost ones, or from, from the least sensitive ones, uh, and you have to be careful there. But again, this is meant to show you what can happen. Okay, now digital cameras have different types of sensors. So there's two different types, there's two major different types of sensors. There's one called a passive pixel sensor, there's one called an active pixel sensor. And so within active pixel, the major one that we have is, is a CMOS sensor, uh, and we also have one that Nikon developed for a little bit, I'm not actually sure if they're using it anymore, is the JFET LBCAST one. And then within the passive pixel sensor, we have CCD. Now there's actually a, a big difference between the two. Typically we see CCD sensors in compact digital cameras, in ones that are, that are not as large, uh, and we see CMOS sensors uh, in larger cameras. And the reason for this disparity is that this, um, the CMOS sensors use slightly less energy, but they're also slightly noisier. But remember that these sensors are much larger than their compact camera brothers, so that means that they can get away with using slightly noisier sensors at the expense of having larger uh, or better battery life because they have these larger sensors. And so um, that, is what, that is one of the reasons, though not the only reason, why uh, digital SLRs tend to have better battery life is that their sensors are more efficient. Now the CCD, on the other hand, even though it's more prevalent, um, it is less noisy, which is good for compact digital cameras because they're already pretty much as noisy as, as people can tolerate them to be, but they do occupy or they do take up more uh, battery life than your typical CMOS sensor. So again, as with everything else, it's give or take, and most of the time they select to have less noise at the expense of using more of your AA batteries. And um, one of the things that I think is, is particularly neat to take a look at is this uh, video that I have of how CCDs are made. And uh, this, I think, will um, maybe not... Oof. You probably won't be able to go home and uh, be able to make your own uh, CCD sensor after this, but I do think that it's an interesting look into how, um, into how digital cameras are created. It captures them electronically by converting them into millions of electrical charges. The camera's processor then reads these charges and translates them into pictures or movies. CCDs, or charge coupled devices, are made of silicon, the main element is sand. What's special about silicon? When light hits it, you get electrons. Production begins with a round silicon wafer, six inches in diameter, and about as thick as a shirt cardboard. It goes into a steam oven for three to four hours. The intense heat, along with oxygen and hydrogen gases in the steam, create a glass-like layer on the wafer. This insulates the silicon against the miniature electrical circuitry that will be built on top of it. But first, the wafer is covered in conductive material. This layer measures less than micron. A human hair is a hundred times thicker. Next, a robot applies a one micron thick layer of photosensitive resin, which will undergo a chemical reaction when exposed to light. 
is a mask over the wafer. The pattern on this mask is the schematic for part of the circuitry. When you take a picture, you expose the silicon wafer to light, and that generates electrons. The circuitry carries those electrons to the camera's processor, which reads the charges and translates them into an image. This machine exposes the masked wafer to ultraviolet light. The resin underneath the circuitry pattern remains intact, protecting the conductive layer beneath it. The resin on the areas not masked by the circuitry pattern needs to be removed. Chemicals are sprayed on. This dissolves the resin, exposing the conductive layer underneath. Technicians repeat this entire process with anywhere from 13 to 30 masks until they've built up the full circuitry pattern on the wafer. Next, technicians submerge the wafer in acid, which eats away the uncovered conductive layer. So now, the only conductive material left on the wafer is the actual circuitry. Next step, a thorough rinsing in tap water to remove the residue. Then a rinse with purified water to remove any impurities left by the tap water. Throughout production, contamination is a concern. A single speck of dust can ruin an entire wafer. To protect and insulate the circuitry, the wafer is coated in liquid glass. Then bake for two hours until the glass hardens. The wafer surface is divided into 25 million tiny square cells called pixels. When you take a photo, each pixel records the light intensity of a minute portion of the scene, generating an electrical charge. A filter on the CCD translates each pixel charge into color. The company makes this filter with three pigment powders, red, green, and blue. These three colors combined in varying ratios can reproduce any color. The camera's processor reads and then reconstructs the photograph scene pixel by pixel. Each finished CCD undergoes a battery of automated tests to ensure that all the circuits are functional. The machine marks faulty circuits with ink. Just one bad circuit means the entire CCD needs to be discarded. under a microscope, looking for scratches that might have occurred during the production process. The number of pixels on a CCD varies, depending on what type of camera it's for. This one is a 25 megapixel CCD, meaning it has 25 million pixels. This company even produces a single CCD that has 111 megapixels. So the next time you say cheese, remember that you're producing a digital photo thanks to all that painstaking work that went into the sophisticated CCD semiconductor inside your camera. Now one of the things that's interesting about this is that you'll notice that um, they generate each of these sensors on wafers. And the wafer is a, is a particular size, uh, it's, it's kind of a fixed size. And so if you increase the size of the sensor that you're manufacturing, takes up more space on this wafer. And generally, one of the things that uh, you noticed on, on there was that uh, it's actually kind of common for circuits on these wafers to fail. So if you have a larger sensor that's taking up a larger area on this wafer, then it's more likely that that one sensor is going to be faulty during the manufacturing process. And this is just one of the reasons why full frame sensors are so much more expensive, or these larger sensors are so much more expensive to purchase than these smaller ones. There are, of course, other factors, like generally they give you, you know, better um, features and better digital camera bodies themselves, but the sensor is a significant portion, or at least a not an insignificant portion of the cost itself. And so um, remember that um, with digital photography, size does matter. And even though I'm, I'm quick to say that, you know, compact cameras, they, they have their place and they're very good for a certain amount of things. If you want the utmost in quality, you usually have to go bigger. So next time we will continue with this, but don't forget that this Saturday we have uh,
National CSE 7 Day that uh, John was so kind to, uh, to organize and host for us. Uh, and we will be meeting at, uh, let's see, I have to remind myself, noon this Saturday, the 14th, uh, at the main entrance of the Park Street Tea Stop. We'll all get together. Uh, I'll be carrying my big thing of, of camera stuff, and we'll be taking photos, and we'll be able to, to discuss and talk and do whatever, uh, likely for, um, depending on not only the weather, but how tired we get, um, probably for hour, two hour, maybe three hours, however long we decide. Uh, and, uh, and I hope to see you all there. And until next time, have a great week.